Twenty years have passed since I took that job as a fire lookout in the remote forests of California. Back then, I was a teenager eager to escape the mundane routines of everyday life. The idea of spending a summer perched high in a tower, surrounded by wilderness, seemed like the perfect adventure. I was young, restless, and perhaps a bit naive. I believed that solitude would give me a clearer perspective on life and a chance to figure out who I was and who I wanted to be. The tower was located in the Shasta Trinity National Forest, miles away from the nearest town. It was a solitary wooden structure that stood atop a hill, offering a panoramic view of the sprawling forest below. To get there, you had to navigate a narrow, winding road that was barely more than a dirt trail. I remember the drive up, my old truck struggling with the steep inclines, the dense foliage brushing against the sides like a series of soft whispers urging me to turn back. I had found the job listing in a local newspaper. Fire lookout wanted, must enjoy solitude, it said. The requirements were minimal, just a high school diploma and the ability to live in a remote location for an extended period. The pay wasn't great, but it promised food, accommodation, and most importantly, solitude. I applied without a second thought and was surprised when I got a call for an interview. A week later, I was driving up to my new summer home, my truck loaded with supplies and a head full of romanticized notions about life in the wilderness. The job was straightforward. Keep an eye out for signs of forest fires and report them. I had a radio for communication, binoculars for observation, and a manual that covered the basics of fire lookout duties. I thought it would be an easy job, a peaceful summer spent reading books and enjoying nature. I was partially right. It was peaceful, at least at first. It didn't take long for me to realize that the tower and the forest it overlooked were far from ordinary. Looking back, I can see that my teenage self got more than he bargained for that summer. My first day on the job was filled with contrasting emotions. The excitement was palpable, coursing through my veins as I stepped into the fire lookout tower for the first time. At the same time, the monotony of the remote location settled in. The tower was perched on a hill in the Shasta Trinity National Forest. The view from up there was breathtaking, offering a sweeping panorama of trees, hills, and valleys. Being a fire lookout had always been something I wanted to do. The appeal lay in the solitude it offered, coupled with the sense of responsibility that came with the role. I was to be the eyes of the forest, the first line of defense against wildfires. The idea filled me with a purpose that I had been seeking. The cabin inside the tower was modest but comfortable. Besides the essentials, there were a few shelves stocked with canned food, a first aid kit on the wall, and an old worn-out rug on the wooden floor. A pair of binoculars rested on the windowsill, waiting to be used. The stove was old but functional, and next to it was a small refrigerator. A lantern hung from a hook on the ceiling, providing a warm yellow light that filled the room. But what really drew my attention was an old yellowed piece of paper. It was tucked away in the top drawer of the wooden desk, almost hidden beneath a pile of maps and manuals. My curiosity got the better of me, and I pulled it out. The handwriting was cramped, and the ink had faded, but it was still legible. The list of rules was peculiar, to say the least. It read, The note began with a straightforward warning. To the new lookout, take these rules seriously. They are not a joke and are meant to keep you safe. Don't ever shine your light towards the southwestern tree line. If you hear footsteps on the stairs, don't look to see who it is. Never answer any radio call that comes in after midnight. If you see a figure standing in the clearing during dusk, do not make eye contact. Keep all windows and doors locked between the hours of 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. What were these rules about? Were they some sort of inside joke among fire lookouts? Or perhaps a way to scare newbies like me? I chuckled at the absurdity of it all. It was almost comical, this list of strange rules in a place where the primary concern was supposed to be forest fires. So I folded the paper neatly, returned it to its original place in the drawer, and closed it. 
The thought crossed my mind to toss it in the trash, but something stopped me. Maybe it was the weight of the unexplained, or perhaps a respect for the unknown elements of my new job. I shook off the feeling of unease that had crept up on me. This was no time for distractions or flights of fancy. My role here was clear, to watch for signs of fire and to report them immediately. I had been trained for this. I knew what to do. I took a deep breath, looked out the window at the vast forest that stretched as far as the eye could see, and reminded myself why I was here. This was my job, my responsibility, and I was ready to do it, regardless of any odd rules or unsettling feelings. I sat down at the desk, switched on the radio equipment, and prepared myself for the long night ahead. My focus was on the task at hand, yet a part of me couldn't help but wonder about the unexplained rules. I pushed the thought to the back of my mind. There would be time for that later. For now, I had a job to do. Nightfall arrived faster than I expected, casting the forest into deep shadows. The sky was a blanket of stars, providing just enough light to outline the towering trees. The sounds of the night came alive. Crickets chirped in a constant rhythm, while an occasional owl hooted in the distance. The air was cool, filled with the earthy scent of damp soil and foliage. Inside the tower, boredom had fully set in. The radio sat silent on the desk, its static-filled quietude a testament to the uneventful nature of my shift. A small stack of outdated magazines lay beside it, their pages already turned and stories consumed. The lantern overhead cast a warm glow on the wooden walls, filling the room with a soft yellow light. My eyes landed on the flashlight resting near the window. The list of rules I had found earlier popped into my mind. I chuckled softly. Could shining a light really cause any harm? With that thought, I grabbed the flashlight and aimed it deliberately toward the southwestern tree line. My thumb pressed down on the switch, and the beam of light pierced the darkness. The instant the light touched the trees, a racket of unsettling noises erupted from the forest. It was a chaotic mix of growls, high-pitched shrieks, and the rustling of leaves, as though a multitude of creatures were suddenly roused. My heart immediately started pounding, each beat echoing loudly in my ears. I felt a surge of adrenaline wash over me. Was I hearing one animal, or was it multiple? My mind raced to identify the source. Were these the sounds of known forest animals, or something entirely different? My hand trembled as I switched off the flashlight. The noises ceased as suddenly as they had begun, plunging the forest back into its previous state of nocturnal serenity. I sat there, flashlight in hand, trying to make sense of what just happened. My first thought was to rationalize it. Maybe it was just raccoons, or perhaps a group of nocturnal birds startled by the light. Yet, the intensity and variety of the sounds didn't fit with that explanation. My curiosity was not just piqued, it was ignited, fueled by the enigma of the forest's reaction to a simple beam of light. The list of rules, previously a source of amusement, now gained a level of credibility I couldn't easily dismiss. My eyes darted to the desk drawer where I had stored the list. A sense of unease settled over me, conflicting with my rational mind. After the flashlight incident, I sat back down, my fingers idly flipping through the pages of an old hunting magazine. The articles were about gear, techniques, and stories of successful hunts, but my eyes just glossed over the text. My mind kept drifting back to that drawer, to the list of rules I had found. The sense of mystery surrounding the list was gnawing at me. It felt like a puzzle with pieces missing, begging to be solved. Suddenly, the sound of footsteps climbing the wooden stairs to the tower broke the silence. My eyes instinctively darted towards the door. The rule about not looking sprang into my mind, clear as day. A battle raged within me. Curiosity screamed for me to check, while an inexplicable sense of caution urged me to heed the warning. In a moment of tense indecision, I gripped the arms of my chair so hard my knuckles turned white. I forced my eyes away from the door and stared intently at the radio, 
its dials and buttons, suddenly the most interesting things in the room. The footsteps grew louder and heavier, each step sending a new wave of tension through my body. And then, just as suddenly as they had started, they stopped. The ensuing silence was so intense it was almost tangible. My chest loosened, and I let out a sigh of relief that I hadn't realized I was holding in. Questions flooded my mind. What was making those footsteps? Why did they stop? And most importantly, why was it so crucial not to look? Time crawled by, each minute stretching longer than the last. Despite my best efforts, I couldn't refocus on my job. My eyes kept darting to the window, scanning the tree line as if expecting an answer to materialize. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I caught movement. A shadow, larger and darker than any animal I could think of, moved between the trees. It was there for a split second, and then it vanished, swallowed by the darkness of the forest. My senses were on high alert now. I strained my ears and picked up faint, unidentifiable sounds carried on the breeze, sounds that resembled whispers more than any natural forest noise. My thoughts raced faster than I could process them. Could this place be haunted? Was I in the territory of some dangerous, unidentified animal? Or was it something else? Something that couldn't be easily categorized or explained? The room felt smaller now, the walls closing in as my imagination ran wild. The list of rules, once a curiosity, now felt like a lifeline that I had foolishly ignored. The air in the room grew thicker, heavy with unanswered questions and a mounting sense of unease. What had I gotten myself into? The rest of the night was a blur of heightened senses and racing thoughts. I tried to busy myself with tasks, anything to keep my mind off the strange occurrences. I tested the radio, making sure it was set to the correct frequencies. I even took to cleaning, wiping down the countertops and sweeping the floor. But no matter what I did, my eyes kept returning to the window, and my ears strained for any out-of-place sounds. Around midnight, I decided to make some coffee, hoping the caffeine would keep me alert. As the aroma filled the cabin, I felt a slight sense of normalcy return. I sat down with my mug and took a sip relishing the warmth and bitterness. Just as I was about to convince myself that I had imagined all the weird events, the radio buzzed to life. Static filled the room, followed by an incoherent voice. My heart sank as I remembered the rule about not answering radio calls after midnight. I looked at the clock. It was 12.05 a.m. Without touching the radio, the voice stopped, and the static died down. For the next couple of hours, Nothing out of the ordinary happened. Maybe the coffee helped, or perhaps the absence of any more strange occurrences calmed my nerves. Eventually, I felt my eyelids grow heavy. I looked at the clock. It was nearly 4 a.m. I remembered the rule about keeping doors and windows locked between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. A quick check confirmed they were secure. Feeling a sense of relief, I decided it was safe to catch a few hours of sleep. I lay down on the bed, still fully clothed, and pulled the blanket over me. Sleep came surprisingly quick, and for those few hours, I was asleep. Eventually, the first rays of morning light streamed through the window, pulling me from my slumber. I sat up, momentarily disoriented, before the events of the previous night came rushing back. A glance at the clock confirmed it was well past 6 a.m. I got up, stretched, and walked over to the window. The forest looked different in the daylight, less menacing but still filled with secrets. I brewed a fresh pot of coffee and sat down at the desk. The list of rules lay there, a constant reminder of the unknown. Despite the unsettling experiences, I felt a strange sense of anticipation. I was, after all, here for a job, a responsibility that included more than just watching for fires. As I looked out over the trees, bathed in the soft morning light, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was on the edge of discovering something extraordinary, something that defied explanation. I dressed, put on my boots, and stepped outside to breathe in the fresh morning air. The forest was awake, alive with the sounds of birds and the rustle of leaves in the wind. I climbed the stairs back to the tower, 
ready to face another day and whatever mysteries it might hold. After an uneventful day and the events of the first night, a mix of caution and curiosity wrestled within me. The strange happenings were an undeniable warning, but my curiosity was too strong to ignore. Rather than leaving things to chance, I opted for a more organized method to delve into the mystery surrounding me. The idea of systematically testing each rule entered into my thoughts. I rummaged through my bag and pulled out a journal. I initially brought for nature sketches and observations. It was about to serve a very different, perhaps darker role. For my experiment, the first rule was up. Don't ever shine your light towards the southwestern tree line. Though I had already broken this rule, I felt a need to probe further. With my flashlight in one hand and the journal open on the table, I waited for the sun to sink below the horizon. When darkness finally engulfed the forest, I pointed the flashlight in the prohibited direction and clicked it on. The reaction from the forest was instantaneous, much like my first night, but with key differences. The strange symphony of noises erupted again, only this time the volume was amplified, almost as if it was filled with irritation or maybe even anger. The shadows, too, had changed. They moved in a frenzied manner, darting between the trees as if agitated by the light. The sight was unsettling. These are not normal animal behaviors. Something else is at play here. I hastily scribbled down every detail in my journal, my hand barely keeping up with my racing thoughts, and switched off the flashlight. Having completed the first test, I found myself grappling with a blend of fear and fascination. On one hand, the increasingly intense reactions from the forest were a clear sign that I was meddling with forces I didn't understand. On the other hand, I was intrigued. I needed to learn more. I took a deep breath and searched through my journal. The neat handwriting had turned into a hurried scrawl as I jotted down my observations, a testament to the growing tension. I was at a crossroads. Part of me wanted to halt the experiment, to respect the rules and the entity or entities they were designed to protect me from. Another part wanted answers, driven by a curiosity that had always been a defining part of who I was. Rule 2 dealt specifically with the mysterious footsteps ascending the tower's stairs. As the days passed, these occurrences became more frequent. Initially, they were sporadic, maybe once a night. But then they became a regular event, sometimes happening multiple times in a single night. The sound was distinct, the slow, deliberate steps of what seemed to be a heavy-footed creature or person. It was as if whatever was climbing the stairs wanted to be heard. The rule's warning was unmistakable. Don't look. Something deep within my gut, an instinctual sense of caution that went beyond logic, underscored the importance of this rule. It was as if my subconscious was communicating a primal fear, a dire warning not to break this particular guideline. Who or what is making those footsteps? The question was a splinter in my mind, gnawing at me each time the steps resumed their slow climb. The urge to peek was nearly overwhelming. Each time the footsteps began, my eyes would involuntarily dart toward the door. My heart would pound in anticipation. Could it be an animal? A person? Or something else entirely? To resist the temptation, I developed coping mechanisms. The radio on the desk became my go-to focal point. I would stare at its dials and knobs, even sometimes reaching out to touch them as if the tactile sensation could anchor me in reality. At other times, I would flip through my journal, rereading previous entries or even doodling aimlessly, anything to distract my attention away from the door. But despite these efforts, my ears remained acutely tuned to the sound of each footstep, counting them as they ascended and then ceased. As the days went by, my journal filled up with observations. The more rules I broke, the more active the creature became. Initially, I only caught glimpses of it through my binoculars. It was a shadowy figure that moved with incredible speed, making it hard to discern any features. Each time I saw it, it was closer to the tower than before. It's actually real. 
What is it, though? A guardian of the forest? Or something else? The creature began revealing itself more boldly as I continued breaking the rules. I remember the night I broke the rule about answering radio calls after midnight. A distorted voice came through, speaking in a language I couldn't understand. That was the night I saw the creature closer to the tower than ever before. I was scared out of my wits, but at the same time, I felt a sense of awe and wonder. I'm actually witnessing something most people would never believe. Is it dangerous, or just as curious about me as I am about it? Despite the escalating strangeness and potential danger, I felt like I was piecing together a complex puzzle. Each rule seemed to correlate with specific behaviors of the cryptid, almost as if the rules were set by the creature itself, or perhaps by previous fire lookouts who had observed its behavior. I'm not the first to experience this. How many before me have known about this creature? Why isn't this public knowledge? But as the creature got closer to the tower with each rule I broke, my sense of wonder started to give way to a feeling of dread. I began to question the wisdom of what I was doing. Am I poking the bear here? What if this creature is dangerous? The thought shook me, but the scientist in me wanted to complete the experiment. I couldn't stop now. I needed to understand the full scope of what was happening here. However, the last straw was the night I kept the windows and doors unlocked between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m., clearly breaking another rule. That night, the creature came so close to the tower that I could hear its heavy breathing. It was the most terrifying moment of my life. A few days later, the rule about not looking at whoever or whatever was ascending the stairs had loomed over me like an ominous cloud. Among all the rules, this one held the most enigma and, if my gut feeling was accurate, the most potential for danger. Tonight's the night. I'm going to do it. I'm going to break this rule. A complex mix of emotions settled within me. Dread at what I might discover, mixed with an odd form of excitement at finally unlocking the mystery. I took a deep breath. The timing seemed almost scripted. Just as I finalized my decision, the sound of footsteps began to resonate. Each step was deliberate and calculated, creaking under the weight of whatever entity was making its way up. It was as if the creature, too, had been waiting for this moment, for this confrontation. My heart thumped loudly in my chest. Every beat seemed to sink with each creak of the stairs. My eyes were drawn magnetically toward the door, the final barrier between me and the mystery I had been probing. Weeks of rule-breaking, journal entries, and restless nights have led me to this. It's time to meet the unknown face to face. My hand automatically clenched into a fist. I wasn't sure if it was an unconscious act of preparing to defend myself or a physical manifestation of my dwindling courage, trying to hold on to it for just a few seconds longer. The footsteps continued their slow ascent, growing louder and more defined as they approached the top of the staircase. Each sound seemed to reverberate through the air, filling the room with a palpable sense of impending revelation. It was as if the world held its breath, waiting for this singular moment of truth. The footsteps were now just one step away. I could feel my pulse in my throat and hear the blood rushing in my ears. This was it. Summoning every ounce of courage I had left, I turned my head to look, breaking the one rule that I had been most reluctant to violate. The door slowly creaked open, breaking the heavy silence that filled the room. Before me stood the cryptid, a figure almost beyond description. It towered over me, clearly taller than any human I'd ever seen. Its body was a bizarre combination of fur and scales, as if nature couldn't decide what it should be. But what caught my attention the most were its eyes. They glowed a soft yet unsettling shade of blue that seemed to pierce the darkness. Despite its terrifying appearance, the creature made no aggressive moves. It simply stood there, locking eyes with me. For a heartbeat, it felt as if time had frozen, as if the universe paused to witness this unlikely meeting. We were two creatures from entirely different realms, brought together by circumstance and perhaps curiosity. 
It's not making a move to harm me. It's just staring, as puzzled by my presence as I am by its... Breaking the tense silence, the cryptid issued a low sound that was more akin to a murmur than a growl. It was an ambiguous noise, neither welcoming nor threatening. With one last lingering look, the creature began to back away, each step deliberate as it made its descent down the stairs. My eyes stayed glued to its body until it was swallowed by the enveloping darkness of the night. As the door settled back into its frame with a soft creak, I let out a breath I hadn't realized I was holding. My body felt like a bundle of frayed nerves, my legs were shaky, and my mind was a whirlpool of thoughts and emotions. That's when the realization washed over me, as clear and as startling as a bolt of lightning. The rules that I had found, the ones I had so cavalierly chosen to break one by one, were not mere tales meant to scare the new recruit. They were a carefully constructed set of guidelines, a framework that allowed for the delicate coexistence of human and the creature. After that night, my perspective underwent a fundamental change. The thrill of defying the rules and probing the unknown was replaced by a sobering understanding of why those rules existed in the first place. I had thought they were just about human safety, a way to protect the new guy on the job. I was wrong. These rules were a complex framework designed for the well-being of all the forest's inhabitants. So, I made a conscious decision to adhere to them. My compliance wasn't driven by fear or the desire to avoid confrontation. Instead, it came from a respect for the intricate balance of life that my previous actions had thrown into disarray. Once I started obeying the rules, the environment around me seemed to transform. The forest exuded a sense of peace and harmony that I hadn't sensed before. This got me wondering. Had the forest always had this serene atmosphere and my actions disturbed it? Or was this a new development, a direct result of my altered behavior? Moreover, the cryptid appeared to recognize and respond to my change in attitude. Gone were the eerie footsteps up the stairs of the tower in the dead of night. The radio remained silent, devoid of any inexplicable interference or mysterious calls and the sightings of shadowy figures moving among the trees ceased. It was as if the cryptid was acknowledging my newfound respect for the rules and responding in kind. I felt that we had reached an unspoken agreement, a mutual understanding that neither of us would cross the boundaries that allowed us both to inhabit this space. As the days stretched into weeks, the sense of peace that had settled over the forest showed no signs of dissipating. The absence of eerie occurrences, the tranquility of the surroundings, and the muted activities of the forest's creatures all seemed to affirm that this was the natural state of things. This equilibrium is how the forest is meant to be. It's the environment where both the cryptid and I can coexist without conflict. While the cryptid had ceased its more overt activities, it was not entirely invisible. Periodically, usually around the time when the sky took on the warm, muted colors of dusk, I would spot it. Always at a respectful distance, it would appear among the trees, momentarily visible in the fading sunlight. These sightings were never prolonged. They felt more like brief check-ins, a way for the creature to affirm that the equilibrium we had established was still in place. The most remarkable moment came about a month later. I was sitting in the tower, lost in a book, when I heard a soft rustle outside the window. Glancing out, I saw the cryptid standing at the edge of the clearing. It was closer than it had ever been since our confrontation, yet I felt no fear. Our eyes met, and the creature gave what could only be described as a nod before turning and disappearing into the forest. That was the moment I knew for sure. We had reached an understanding a mutual respect that transcended words or explanations. As the days on the calendar dwindled down, I couldn't help but feel a sense of melancholy. My time in the fire lookout tower was coming to an end, and the reality was starting to sink in. On my last night, the forest seemed unusually still, as if aware that a chapter was closing. I sat there in the quiet, reflecting on the encounters, the rules, 
and the enigmatic creature that had been both a source of fear and a teacher of great lessons. Just when I was lost in my thoughts, I heard it, footsteps on the stairs. The sound was familiar, a sequence of creaks and thuds that had once filled me with dread. This time, however, I felt a sense of calm wash over me. I don't need to look. I know what this means. True to the rule I had once broken, I didn't turn my head to see who or what was there. Instead, I focused on the radio equipment that had sat silently on the desk for so many nights. The footsteps reached the top of the stairs, lingered for a moment, and then retreated, fading away into the depth of the night. The next morning, as I prepared to leave, I felt a sense of peace envelop me. I packed my belongings, took one last look around the tower that had been my home, and began my descent. Each step felt heavy, weighed down not by regret, but by the gravity of the experiences I was carrying with me. I had done my part, upheld my end of the agreement. I had maintained the balance of the forest, and in doing so, honored the unique relationship that had formed between me and the creature. As I reached the bottom of the stairs and stepped into the clearing, the forest seemed to greet me with a serene silence. I took a moment to breathe it all in. I didn't see the cryptid that morning, but I didn't need to. As I walked away, I couldn't help but feel that this experience would stay with me forever, shaping my understanding of the world in ways I couldn't yet fully comprehend.